Hi guys, so today we're going to be talking about the beauty of the English language in the form of grammar. Oh, how everybody loves grammar, and if you probably just heard that term, you either paused the video, X'd out, or you're going to stay because you're slightly intrigued about what I have to say about grammar. Don't you just love it and block scheduling, especially when you get to sit down in a class for 90 minutes when the teacher just says, we're going to learn about grammar today. Oh, yes, the beauty of antecedents, demonstrative pronouns, demonstratives, indefinite pronouns, interrogative pronouns, negative pronouns, person, personal pronouns, possessive pronouns, general pronouns, reciprocal pronouns and reflexive pronouns. Oh, and more and more pronouns! Anyway, moving right along. Point is, we all love grammar, and those of you that don't, well, I'm sorry, but you're going to have a tough time in life. So, and if, I'm going to make this video specifically for high schoolers and young college students, but also for the, anyone that really wants to watch this, good for them, but high schoolers, if you listen to this, I will save your life. End of subject, goodbye, good day. Listen to this and you will survive college. Freshmen and sophomores in college, if you listen to this, you can still save yourself and redeem yourself. Juniors and seniors, if you are just learning these rules for the first time, good luck in graduate school, and if you're not going to graduate school, we now know why. Okay, moving right along. Some of you might label me as a grammar Nazi, and I accept that term boldly. However, there are people people in this world who do not share that level of comfort in the word Nazi, and we need to account for those people, mainly Germans and Austrians. So to account for them, we're going to need something that is more pleasing. Fascist. I like fascist. And if you're against the word fascist, well, you can't please everybody in this world, so you're just going to have to learn to live with it. So, fascist. Yeah, the wonderful Benito Mussolini of Italy, Adolf Hitler of Germany, Austria, Francisco Franco of Spain, Hideko Toji of Japan, Chiang Kai-shek of China, and Engelbert Dollfuss of Austria, whose idea of Stalinschat was borrowed from Benito Mussolini. Dollfuss discovered parliament and established a clerical fascist dictatorship, which lasted until Austria was incorporated into Nazi Germany through the Anschluss of 1938. History Lesson 101 for you. Anyway, moving right along. So, to start our grammar fascist tour of the English language, we are going to start with the beauty of apostrophes. Apostrophes are a beautiful part of the English language, and you use them every single day, whether you're writing or speaking. I probably used over 20 in the past two minutes of this video alone. Apostrophes, they have two rules about when you use them. There is one exception ex outside these two rules, which I'll show you later. Aside from that one exception and these two rules, you will never use an apostrophe, and I'm going to show you. The first rule is Apostrophes are meant to show possession. They are sure that you own something. Anyway, second rule is contractions. Those are the two rules. Exception will come later. We're going to look at an example sentence. For instance, F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote about the 20s. Right there, that is a Microsoft Word error. The 20s, that right there is not an apostrophe. That is an open single quote. That is incorrect. Microsoft Word is going to correct that as a open single quote. The grammatically correct way to write it is with an apostrophe. Microsoft Word is not your friend, and you need to be able to tell it that that is incorrect and you need to correct it to make it grammatically correct. Correct, 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 correct. Anyway, so you do not use an open single quote. Use an apostrophe. Why? The whole point of an apostrophe is to let you know that you've left something out. Let the reader know that something has been left out. If I put don't, the whole reason I have an apostrophe there is to let the reader know that I left out the O in not. Don't. Ever think about it that way? That's the whole reason of an apostrophe when it contractions, is to show that you left something out. So, for instance, if, if you're looking at hymns even, when you're singing a hymn and you ever see heaven instead of heaven, they're wanting you to pronounce as one syllable. Hence, they'll put apostrophe N and they'll leave out the E. The whole point of that apostrophe is to show that you left out the E, and that way you pronounce it differently. For instance, in Old English, the word leaped. They used to pronounce it leaped. So in order to pronounce leaped, they would do apostrophe D. It also shows how you would pronounce something. But again, an apostrophe is there to show that you left something out. Therefore, going back up to why an open single quote is incorrect, you use an apostrophe because you're leaving out the 19 in 1920s. You use not correct to put an open single quote. You put an apostrophe. Whether it be the 30s, 40s, or 50s, you will always use an apostrophe because you were leaving out the prefix. So now if I'm moving on, if I could go 20s with an apostrophe S, that is also incorrect. Why? Because there is no ownership. There is no possession. The 20s does not own anything. Some of you who were born in the 20s are like, yeah, believe me, they own a lot. But no, the 20s do not own anything. There is no ownership. In order to have that apostrophe, you need to be able to look at that sentence and say, I need to be able to see what is being owned and who is owning it. 20s doesn't own anything. Bob's car. Bob's owner car owned. Okay? Apostrophe, yes. I can see who's being owned. What's being owned? Car. And who's owning it? Bob. 
Now, third thing, apostrophes do not show plurals. Huge misconception. They do not show plurals. I go to the pond to see the ducks. There is no apostrophe at the end of ducks. That is just stupid, and it makes you look grammatically dumb. You do not use an apostrophe there. There is no rule in the English language where you can use an apostrophe to make a plural. You just add an S to make it plural. Unless something is being owned, you add S or ES. It depends on the word, and I'm not going to get into that whole thing. No apostrophe in ducks. No ducks at the pond. The ducks are the object of the preposition. To see the ducks. And it, End of subject. Okay, now time for the exception to the rule. Alright, so if I say, I got an A on the test, here's where you run into trouble. If I say, we all got A's, okay, if I don't find an apostrophe there, I mean, how do I read that? I mean, we all got A's? That doesn't make any sense. That is the only rule where you can put an apostrophe for A's when you're using a single letter, basically. A's, B, C, D's, E, F, G, all the way down to Z. If you're using one single letter, you can use an apostrophe. That's the only exception. All right, now before we move on to our next topic, I want to get to one quick thing, and that is the word no one. No one is two words. If you put it as one, that is noon, or noonie, or nuna. That is the last name of someone, or probably a British way to spell noon. Anyway, not the point. No one is two words. Or if you want to use one, you're going to have to use the word nobody. End of subject. Okay, moving on. So since we've just spent the past six minutes ragging on the fact that you can't use a single quote in place of a comma, let's actually talk about a single and double quote. When to use each? Single quotes you only use for one thing, and that is to quote someone else who is quoting something. So if I have the thing, if I have a sentence, Nick said, Tom said, don't do that. Don't do that is in single quotes. Tom said, don't do that is all in double quotes. If that makes sense, the visual help. But point is, single quotes are only for quoting someone quoting someone. When you're using a double quote, it's just someone who, it's just the actual quote. Next thing, block quotes. A block quote is used, you've probably seen in many formal papers, and when you see it, you're like, oh, that must be super, that person must be super smart because they're using block quotes. A block quote just means that you're quoting something that takes up more than four lines of text in your paper. Therefore, you just block it out. You put it one tab past your normal indent. So if you look at your paragraphs, where it's each paragraph's indented, indented as you normally would, and then indented again. That part, if you're writing a double-spaced paper, you are going to single-space the block quote. The block quote does not get any type of quotation marks because the point of blocking it is to let the reader know that you are actually quoting it from the piece of literature or whatever. So do not put quotation marks around a block quote. Now, if I want to bring emphasis to something, for instance, if something a word is really important in the sentence or you're trying to em emphasize sarcasm on something and you're like and you want to put quotes around it, you do not put single quotes. That is double quotes. Double double double. Another thing, look at these commas right here in the sentence. Each of those commas, those can also be replaced with colons. If a sentence is grammatically complete, being introduced to something else that's grammatically complete, you can either use a comma or a colon. The reason you just don't see that in society is because it's more acceptable and I guess it's just more common to use a comma. But you can use a colon there. A colon is basically to inform the reader that something more is coming along. That's it. On, that's all I'm going to spend on quotes. Moving on, since we're just talking about how to cite something, let's actually talk about citations. Okay, so for all you young people out there, whether you're in middle school or early high school, if you haven't written a paper yet where you have to cite the author, you will at some point in your life. I mean, that's all you do in college is write papers and you have to give credit back to the author. So I recently just wrote a paper on The Great Gatsby. The only resource I can use is The Great Gatsby. So when I pulled a quote from there, like we learned how to put it in quotation marks, at the end of those quotation marks, after the final quote, the closing quote, quote mark, I have to put the page number I got it from. In this case, let's just say 31. Now, The Great Gatsby was written by F. Scott Fitzgerald. So I'm going to write, after the quote, I'm going to write parentheses 31, period, again. Okay? I am not going to put Fitzgerald 31 in parentheses. I'm not going to put page 31, PG 31. I'm going to just put the number. Blah, 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 quote, number, period. That, that's all you put. In the parentheses is the number. 
Now let's say you're writing a research paper and using multiple resources. So let's say I have Fitzgerald and Chesley writing. I have two different authors. Now if I'm going to use multiple authors, that's when you do put the author's last name. So you are going to, at the end of the quote, you're going to put parentheses Chesley 35, period. Or, and then whenever you cite Fitzgerald, you're going to put Fitzgerald 31, close parenthesis, period. So you do use the author's last name when you're using multiple resources. However, there is no comma that goes between the author's last name and the page number. It's just name, number, close parenthetical, okay? That's for that. Now for block quotes, if I'm blocking something off, at the end of the block quote, again, you're going to have the ending quotation marks, then in the parentheses, 65, page 65, no period, just in parentheticals, the number you got it from. And if you're using multiple resources, name, number, done. Now if I'm writing them before, if I do an intro, like L.F. Scott Fitzgerald said this, colon, block quote, then you do not need Fitzgerald, again, at the very end, you just need the page number because you already said it's coming from Fitzgerald, okay? So that's citing or author. That's all for part one, guys. In part two, I'll be covering ellipses, italics, how to actually cite a title of a book or a chapter in a book. Um, I'm also going to be going then versus than, dangling modifiers, pronoun agreement, intensifiers, and also a hyphen versus an n-dash versus an m-dash.